God is good. Take seats for a moment. And stay, stay in that place. Change the rain slowly. And so my Bible is in Second Thessalonians chapter three. to live in the light 
of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has taught about the coming of Christ. He has encouraged them. He has corrected them. You know, he's, he's got them to think about how they are to live, how they are to interact with others. And now, there's just a, another challenge that needs to be dealt with. And it's kind of, we touched on it early on in the series, but it's to deal with some disorderly people within the church. You wouldn't believe there are disorderly people within the church, would you? <laughs> really? Goodness me. Amen. And so I think today we're going to learn some important principles. Let's just go for the first one. The first important principle that we learn is separation. Separation. It's interesting how the Lord has conducted the service this morning and led us as we've been speaking and kind of reflecting on His holiness, but also on our own need for holiness. To understand that God is holy. And you know, his will for your life is your sanctification, which means being set apart, being separated. This was a community of people in the, in the city of Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. You know that they were called to be separated. Separated. And so the first principle is separation. What does he say in verse 6? But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. You know, it may shock us this morning, but actually we are part of a community. Very often in the West, when we think about our relationship with God, we are very individualistic. It's just me and God. But actually, that is not the way that it works. Not biblically, not scripturally. We are part of a community. Yes, you're an individual. Yes, you have an individual relationship with God. But you are a part of a community. We are family. I'm not going to start singing, alright? We are family. <laughs> We're family. Well, that means that there is accountability within the church of Christ. You understand? There's accountability to one another. There's responsibility for each one of us to understand that yes, we walk, we have our individual walk with the Lord, but also that we have a responsibility to one another. We have a testimony to one another. Unfortunately, in this church, not this church, this church, if that's the matter, there were some who were walking disorderly. And Paul is concerned about the purity of the community through these words. Again, what does he say? We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's a strong command, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. And according to the not according to the tradition which he received from us. Withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. That flies in the face of some of our thinking. You know what? Yes, but God is love, and you know, we've got to accept everything and accept all the ways of people, the behaviour of people. Actually, there's a time when you have to withdraw from people. You have to withdraw from people. It's not nothing. Something new in the scriptures. We see elsewhere, Paul instructs the Corinthians not to keep company with any immoral person. Why? Because he's concerned about the purity of the community. Because you're a community. It's not all about you. The world doesn't revolve around you, Robert. It comes as a bit of a shock to some people. So although the church is a family, and though we are instructed in Ephesians to bear with one another in love, and that means to put up with one another's faults and flaws in love, there are limits. There are limits. There are times when we must withdraw ourselves. Why? Because of the power of influence. The power of influence. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, 
Paul says this, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Don't you know that? He actually, he, he, he reprimands the, the, uh, the church of Corinth because they were tolerating immorality within their ranks. They were tolerating impurity within the community. And they were, they were feeling good about themselves for it. You know, look at the love and the tolerance. And Paul actually, he scolds them for doing that. And there was a very serious situation in the church of Corinth where there was an incestuous relationship taking place. And Paul said, you, you need to hand this person over to Satan for a season. You need to be radical. Jesus said, where sin is concerned. You know, if your hand causes you to sin, you need to chop it off. Please don't turn up next week with one hand. It's, it's, it's hyperbole, okay? Or if, you, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Be serious, be radical with sin. Cut it off, cut it out. Separate yourself from it. Don't you know that the little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Now, I know we've got some sourdough bakers in this place, right? <laughs> I know people are starting to latch up to this sourdough bread. I'm no expert with bakery as I'm not an expert in the majority of things, all right? But I've, I've learned that a little bit of the leaven can actually leaven a whole batch. And that's what they did. I know that because the scripture said it, by the way. It's already taught on what's the baking program. So what is it? What's the baking program called? Bake Off. Bake Off. There's some disasters on there at the Bake Off. Goodness, they have to do better. You know what I'm saying? It's a test for the leaven. The leaven from a previous batch, and they would separate the leaven, and then they want to do bake a new batch of dough that would add this leaven, and this leaven because of the bacteria in it would spread. <laughs> Just think about that next time you stuck it into your lap. <laughs> Get some bacteria down. <laughs> it's good bacteria pack. Well, actually, leaven's not a good thing in scripture. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Don't you know that the wrong influence can corrupt a whole community? That's the principle, folks. That's the principle. I want to ask you this morning, as we think about this, who is influencing you right now? In your walk with God, who is influencing you right now? Who is helping to shape your thinking, your character, your actions? What is their influence producing in you? We all have people who influence us, do we not? Whether it be through their thoughts, their words, or deeds. In fact, I would say that I've probably spent most of my life looking for people to influence me. People who I can model myself on. Come on. As we're looking for examples to follow. And there are various people that have come into my life. God has put various people at various times in my life who have had a strong influence upon me. Some in a very good way and some in a bad way. In fact, when I used to get into trouble at school, it was everybody else's fault, wasn't it? Well, remember those days? <laughs> Just have a bad influence on me. But I run out of people and excuses in the end, I think. <laughs> but you know, there's a, there's a power in influence. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And it does. Bad company corrupts good character. So there are times, folks, when you need to separate yourself completely from wrong relationships wrong influences in your life. Whatever is producing negative stuff within you, you need to separate yourself from it. Because very often you can convince yourself, no, I'm going to be the one that influences. But so often we're not. We're influenced by somebody. Who is it? Or what is it that you need to cut off right now? When I was younger, and again, I might have told you this already, but I used to listen a lot to Oasis, the band Oasis. Have you heard of Oasis? Well, you know the score, don't you? When you're 15, when you're 15, that might as well tell a white lie, so they're actually saying that as well as being a white lie. Well, anyway, that's naive. 
Well, I was at 15, I was 21. There you go. So you know the score. But I remember, I remember folks listening to this 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 music, and uh, again, I, I was open to influence, looking for identity. And I remember watching it, and the videos of Liam Gallagher, and there was a certain way he walked. I'm not he didn't have a belly like mine, but no, I'll breathe it. But it was like it's he had a swagger. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I remember walking into the pub, and this is before I knew Jesus, by the way, okay? I remember walking into the pub, and you know, I'd be holding my bottle of beer the way that Liam Gallagher would hold his beer, and I'd be speaking, and my attitude reflected his attitude as well. You know, it was a, it doesn't care less about anything or anybody. It's a year, it's an hour, come on. And that's, that's what I was modeling myself on. And that's what happens, folks, because bad company comes with character. These influence, not that I was very comparable, okay? But the, the point being, you can allow the wrong influences into your life, folks. We need to cut them off. Paul understood that too. And it's not just outside of church, it was within the church, he said. There were people in the church who were walking in a disorderly manner, which actually means to be disruptive, too. Disorderly and disruptive. We'll talk about that as a more in a moment. Who is it that is influencing your life? What was the leaven, so to speak, that was corrupted and that was spreading? Disorderly behaviour. There were those who were disordered. And there's several possibilities to why they were disorderly. And there's not consensus of what amongst the, the commentators as to why they were disorderly. It's quite probable that because they were expecting the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they decided that they were going to do nothing. They were going to pack in their work, you know, and just and just laze about and live off everybody else. That's possible. It's quite possible. But whatever they were doing, they were being disruptive and they were being disorderly and they weren't busy with work. They were busy bodies meddling with everybody else's business. More interested in what everybody else was doing than that, that they should be doing. And Paul rebukes them for such. And Paul instructs the church, you must not permit this to go on, you must withdraw yourself from these people. 1 Peter, Peter says in chapter 4 verse 15, 1 Peter 4 verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler, a meddler, someone who attends the supervision pertaining to others, somebody who's more interested in everybody else's life than their own. That's what he's correcting, that's what he's dealing with. He calls it disorderly and behavior that is not according to the tradition that is passed on to them by the apostles. Separate yourselves from these so-called believers. He says also that they, they were disordered, they were work, um, sorry, they were not working, they were not toiling for their for their keep. Let's live off everyone else. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. And that's a wise bit of advice from the Word of God. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Proverbs 13 and verse 20. Folks, make sure you are listening to the right voices. Make sure you are having the right influences in your life. What is it producing within you? What is this influence producing within you? Follow the right examples. Don't be too quick to, and I'm speaking from experience, you know, when you're looking for a model, you're looking for somebody you can model yourself on, don't be too quick to give somebody the right to be that person. Test the waters, so to speak, first. Or you may pay the price. Secondly, to the principle of imitation. Imitation. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 7 to 9 says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, 
nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Paul was expecting these people to imitate him. But what was his principle? We find it in 1 Corinthians verse, chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Follow my example. As I follow the example of Christ, he is the perfect example for us. Everyone else and everything else is below par. Everything else, but it does not arrive at that standard, folks. Don't treat people as if they are the Christ that you should be looking upon. Okay? Because you'll, you'll become disappointed. However, however, we should and we should look for healthy influence to imitate. Imitate someone who is imitating Christ. To Titus 2 verse 7, Paul says to Titus, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Show yourself to be a good pattern, a good model, a good example for others. That's his instruction by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul, Paul was an example in action. He was an example first in his, in his, well, in his actions, in the way that he conducted himself. Because the way that you conduct yourself says a lot about who you are, folks. It reveals about what's really going on on the inside. Who you, what you think about yourself. The way you deal with others. The way you, you behave with others and before others. Too often, it can be, you know, we've got the right words, but the actions don't line up with the words. And that disqualifies us. It disqualifies us because it makes us hypocrites. Help us all. Help us all. And so he set the example in his actions. You know, he was he was entitled to support from the church. He knew that. He was he was an apostle. And he was entitled to that support, but he chose not to take that support so he could live as an example to those who were disorderly. Because it seems if he had received that support, it would give those who were disorderly ammunition for whatever reason. But he was an example in his actions, he was an example in his attitude. We should see Paul's attitude here. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19 says this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the Lord. Paul was an apostle and very often he had to defend his apostleship. You know, because he had that very strange encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the, the road to Damascus that knocked him off his high horse, literally. And of course, there were a certain amount of witnesses that saw that. But of course, the majority weren't aware of that. So there were many that were questioning his apostleship and whether he really even saw the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Did he really have the, 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 the authority of an apostle? And if you read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, you'll see, and 2 Corinthians, you'll see that there are those within the church that are questioning his apostleship. Paul knew what he'd been called to do. He knew he was an apostle. He knew he was a saint one commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But there were many who did not believe that. There were many who challenged that. But he knew what he was. And he knew the authority that he carried, carried as, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And yet he chooses not to use that authority. Why? Because first and foremost he understands that he's a servant. He's a servant. That was his attitude and that's what he's looking to be for, for us to imitate in his life. Hallelujah. He says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? And that's his, of course, his defense of his apostleship. But we see elsewhere, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, what does he say? It says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. 
He's saying before everything else, before the calling to be an apostle, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I'm like a slave in the household, in other words. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, that is the attitude that we need to imitate in the Apostle Paul. Because it's the same attitude that was in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that because you know the story how Jesus, you know, he took off his outer garment and he put on a towel, he donned the place, he donned the robes of a, of a servant, if you like, assumed the place of a servant and began to wash the disciples' feet. Because changing what he does doesn't change who he is. This is the, this is the principle that he's trying to teach us. Philippians 2, verse 6 to 8. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul again. What does he say? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on. He says, who made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Taking the form of a bondservant. What did the Apostle Paul just describe himself as in Romans 1? A bondservant. Why? Because imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's the attitude. He's saying, lower yourself, humble yourself. Yes, I am an apostle. Yes, I've been called to be an apostle. The Lord Jesus Christ who, who called me to this ministry. Well, first and foremost, I am a servant. I do not build my identity upon that which I do, but I do, folks. But who I am before him. That's, that's the principle. That's why you can say, imitate me. Imitate me. Question for you, thinking about this. How does your life impact others? Could you say, could we say, look, imitate me as I imitate Christ? And you may say, well, oh, come on, that's the Apostle Paul. Hey, he was a man like you or me, or some of us in the room. He was a person that had flaws like you and I. And yet he was called and commissioned by our Lord Jesus Christ to do what he was called to do. Above all else, in our relationship with God, we are sons and daughters. In our roles within his kingdom, we are all priests. All of us are priests, the Bible teaches us. All of us, and we're servants of the Most High God. You understand that this morning? Because if you build your identity on what you do, on your title, on your calling, then what happens is that if that should change, then you have an identity crisis. And you start getting upset with people because they're not recognizing you and your wonderful calling and your title and all these things. You understand? How does your life impact those who are not walking in obedience? Does it have any impact on them? Further. This is what I love. Intention. Talks about the intention. What is God's intention through Paul by instructing these people to withdraw themselves? Remember, this is the Holy Spirit of God that has inspired the Apostle Paul to tell these people, enough, withdraw yourself from them. They're your brothers, but withdraw yourself from them. Don't keep company with them. Oh, that's me. This is the word of God. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with them, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There you go. There we see that the, 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 the severity of God, and there we see it finished with his mercy and his goodness. You know, we need to consider the severity of God, but we all also his goodness. You see that, folks? 
If anyone does not obey our words in this epistle, know that person, make a note of them, get them down in the book, and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Whatever they were doing wasn't serious enough to be excommunicated like what was going on in Corinth. There was no, get rid of him, kick him out of the church, hand him over to Satan. You know? It, was, but it wasn't serious enough to do that. However, it was serious enough to tell these people to withdraw yourselves from them. Do not allow them to have influence in your life. We see that the goal of Paul's admonition is restoration. When God disciplines, and it's something, again, we don't hear much about today, it's not popular to speak about it, but it is a principle within the scriptures that teaches us about our Father. When he disciplines us, he disciplines us with the, the, the goal of rest restoration, seeing us come to repentance and restoration. Just as you, parents, you sometimes have to discipline your children. Not because you get a kick out of disciplining your children, you're not taking their phones away or whatever you do. But because you're trying to teach them, right? You're trying to bring about change in their behaviour or in their thinking. That's the goal, and that's the goal of, of, of this particular uh, decision by the Lord, telling these people to withdraw themselves, that they might be ashamed. Shame that leads someone to consider their condition, that's what it's talking about. To put them into a place where they'll start to think, well, why? What have I done? What do I need to change? That's the idea, that was the goal, the intended goal of disciplining these people. God will do what is necessary to lead us to this place of repentance. I've told you before, I've seen it. I've seen God's discipline. I've seen it when someone refused to change after being challenged by the Holy Spirit. This person was a, held a position in the church and decided to, 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 to lie instead of accepting the responsibility and putting things right. And then I saw the hand of God come upon this person. And bring this person to a place where they, they came back and they were broken. And then now God has restored them into their ministry and their ministry is better than it ever was. That's how God works. He disciplines us as sons and daughters. Hebrews 2 verses 5 to 6. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It's part of the process. It's part of the process. Paul acknowledges that there are limits to this method of discipline. Do not count it. He's saying, okay, you've got to withdraw yourself from it, but do not count him as an enemy. He's not your enemy. Admonish him, warn him as a brother. Do you understand that? Praise God. Praise God. As for you, brothers, don't grow weary in doing good. In other words, don't you know, keep, keep, keep doing what you do. Keep imitating me as I imitate Christ kind of thing. You know, do the right thing. Keep going. Keep going. But set the example. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. That was his letter 2,000 years ago. And it's a letter that's important for us today. Praise God. We need to separate ourselves from all the wrong influences. Number two, we need to imitate him or imitate those who imitate Christ. Ultimately, you're imitating Christ. That's discipleship. Yes? Amen. Always know, always know that God, as our Father, when he disciplines us, he disciplines us because he loves us. Everything he does flows out of his love for us. That's the God that we serve, brothers. 
And that, my friends, brings us to the end of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And I pray that you've been blessed and that the Lord has instructed us and shaped us and corrected us where we need correction. But that we will apply what we've learned. Let's just bow our heads, <coughs> bow our hearts. I just wonder, you know, if the Apostle Paul was alive today and was writing an epistle to our church here in King's Country Christian Centre, what would he write? What are the things that he would challenge? in us, <clears throat> the things that he would encourage us in, what are the things that he would correct us about? And as we just think and reflect on what we've heard this morning, how, how do you respond to this? Are you, are you just, you know, you've learned something else and out we go, we crack on. What, what is it that the Holy Spirit has said to you this morning? What is it that he's, he's wanting to produce in you this morning? What is it that he's questioned you about? What do you need to separate yourself from? What influence needs to be broken off? What's it producing in your life? How is your life impacting others? Are others looking at you and thinking, I need to imitate this person as they imitate Christ? Do we know the Father? It's possible to be in a relationship with Him and yet barely know Do we know the Spirit of Christ?
your call, your correction, your challenge this morning, Lord. And that we'll take the necessary steps, Father. Because, Lord, we want to be influenced by you. Lord, we want to grow in our understanding of you, but also in our likeness of you, Lord. That you, Holy Spirit of God, will continue to cultivate your fruit in our lives. And as we've heard this morning, that we might reflect your glory. That we might live as examples to be followed. People to be imitated as we imitate Christ. Shape us, Lord. Mold us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
to see him glow. Standing at his arms high and high, abandoned, in awe of the one who gave it all. Stand my soul, Lord, to you, surrendered. All I am is yours. That's what it means to follow Christ. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, this week, we're going to listen to some testimonies in a moment, but this, this particular moment is, is very important. Because I was talking to somebody this week that came to, to the church my office and was asking me all about what it means to be a Christian and what it means to follow Christ. And uh, we had a we had a chat. We had a chat. And it was a good chat. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna hold me in suspense. I'm gonna invite that person to come forward. To rush. You've been with us now. How long have you been with us now? Two months? No, about two months. And uh, obviously, Anna, Turaj, and the other Iranians come as well. And they become a part of our family. And during this time, I know that there have been people praying. Praying for you, brothers. Turaj came, was it Wednesday? And was it Thursday? <laughs> Tuesday? Last time. Came on Tuesday. And uh, we've just been praying. We've noted how the Holy Spirit has been moving upon Turaj. Having spoken on on Tuesday, you know, Turaj decided to take the decision. Yeah, decided to take the decision. Yeah. And in front of you all today, he wants you to see the decision that he's taking. Okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died for me on the cross and paid the price for my sin. Thank you that he rose again on the third day that I might have the eternal life. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you now and ask you to come in and be my Lord and Savior, to change me and take uh, and make me your disciple. Amen. 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 He asked me, you know, I sat there speaking to him. We were there for about an hour first, and I'm telling him about Jesus and the cross. And he's basically just comes to the end of it. He's like, well, what do I got to do now? You know what I'm going to do? I want to be a Christian. We're going to be a Christian. Praise God. 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 Spirit of God's already done the work and that's it. Praise God. Yeah, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I think that's brilliant. Amen. And we're with you, both of you, on this journey to help you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Part of the family. God is good. Okay. We, 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 I know you're, you're all thinking coffee and tea is too early. So we, we have some more testimonies. We might have an aerobic class. <laughs> I don't know. There we go. Because what 
we're saying to people is, and when we're having a conversation, we're saying actually, you know, we're available, we're here last Saturday of every month, we don't have to be long. And, and just come and talk with us, ask your questions, we'll pray with you. Just being visible, and for each person in the outreach team, they have one of those. And we've also got a business card, we've got an uh, outreach email address. So if you're having a conversation with someone, it's really difficult to come away and you can't carry on that conversation. But if you think it's an opportunity where you need that continuation or to give someone that opening, we've got this. Um, so at the end of May, we did the Rose Eats Outreach, as you can see, that's our meeting. Um, and a rose, you know, and God says to us, what have you got in your hand? And it's nothing about the rose, it's about what's on the rose, the fact that the rose creates interest, and it's the opportunity, and it's what you make of that opportunity. And when you're walking around in the marketplace and you have a rose, people are curious. And so, I was reminded, I'm trying to think, and I was reminded of something that I had on my phone last night. And I think when you're doing outreach, you kind of feel like you always have to share the gospel. But this was something that I had on my phone, and it said that we recognise that we're looking for a cure. When you go to the doctor, you don't say, I have cancer. Instead, you describe your symptoms. That's where most people live. They only see their symptoms. They say, I'm lonely. I'm suffering with a broken relationship. I'm stressed. The darkness within me um, that I don't know what to do with. And how do we share Christ with someone who's overwhelmed with their symptoms? We know the ultimate cure. It's Jesus Christ. He didn't die for their symptoms, but he died for their sin. People don't wake up in the morning and think, you know, I need to accept Jesus. They wake up with the symptoms. And so as people who are attempting to rescue those who are lost, we need to start with their symptoms. Show them the disease, which is sin, and take them to the ultimate cure, which is Jesus. So I want to invite some members of the team to come um, to the front and just share their experience of the last hour. Moving on. So there's a place for that. I 
still going to be opportunities to do that. So I didn't always expect a, a boat if you had the roses. <laughs> so I'm not going to respond. Thankfully, I've got a rose by the side. <laughs> um, so she was there to make things a bit easier. And, um, but it was, it was one, I mean, the first person we went to, and they said, uh, Oh, thank you. Okay. Yes. And so I, I always thought, Oh, okay, yeah, we're going to do like this. But all the ones afterwards were wonderful. It was amazing because it was a, it was a way to connect with somebody. Oh, yeah. uh, which wasn't intimidating. Uh, we did sometimes have to say, look, we don't want we're going to give you some work, give us some money for this. Yeah. We just want to give you a rose and we're going to tell you who we are, who we represent, so it's so who we are, why we do this, who we represent. And then just generally we'd say, can we pray for you? And so they said, oh yes, please. Most of the time they said, yes, please. But all of us who wants to pray, we well, most of it was like peace and happiness and, and um, you know, prayer for sickness and, and stuff like that. It was almost for a job, wasn't it? So, yeah, and that's great. Um, one special, specific person for me was a, a, a young lady with her husband and her son. I can't remember her name, his name was Richard. Somebody had already spoken to him and given her a rose, but she heard to came and found me late and said, can I have a rose for my son and my husband? <laughs> and so we gave them a rose as well. And I said, well, can we pray for you? And she said, yes. Yeah. And um, what would God like pray for? She said, we just want peace and happiness. And so we pray for them. Again, that's the Lord for peace and happiness. And it's just a way to connect with people, to show them that we care. And, you know, it's, it's a great team, but I think we could add some more to it, could we? Especially some men, please. <laughs> yeah, so um, I do find things like that quite difficult, uh, just approaching people. But after I've done it a few times, I've, I've just got the hang of it. I've got to <laughs> <laughs> um, But like John said, most people are really, really blessed. Um, and so, yeah, the one lady with the dog, you know, she said, oh, she said, can you pray for pray for me? She said, yeah, my dog's really poorly. And so we started to pray for her dog, and she was crying, and it was just really, really and she really, really appreciated the prayer, didn't she? So it was just nice to be able to, to bring Jesus to her dog <laughs> and her. Um, and also we blessed the um, big issue lady. Um, so, you know, she was really blessed. I bought a big issue off her and we prayed for favour. And when we walked past her again, she said, It's worse. <laughs> <laughs> And stuff on in the marketplace. Um, I went and bought a couple of rows, but they'd already had one. And she said it's so lovely just to be given that. Um, and she even put it on Facebook saying about the, the rows that she had. Um, so it was really, really lovely. Um, so yeah. Uh, well, I can just reiterate everything that's been said. Uh, Deb and I stayed around the marketplace. Um, neither of us very good at this type of thing, as you can see. Um, but we were blessed. And that's the one thing I, I took from it. We, we didn't have any refusals of giving those. And like John said, if you remember quite happy, I think they were going to give us the ones that they put. <laughs> <laughs> we had a blessing in ourselves because we had preparation before together and we prayed, you know. And to me, it's a bonding process. We can all say hello to one another on a Sunday, if you haven't gone on a Sunday. But do we know one another like we can be here today? And for me, like I said to Joe, it's a bonding process with each of us. And I just thank God that we were able to get stronger as we went along with talking <coughs> And as I shared last week with some of the Bible study, if you have come to the Bible study, come along with me. There's lots of us who get to know us. Um, all come from this world, which we share with the people with the roses. But the one thing we pray is that whatever we say to these people, they accept the rose and they thank God at the time. 
but we're praying. Holy Spirit, do that in their minds and their hearts so that maybe not at this time do they feel they need God, but in the future there's going to come a time when they're going to call on God, which we all do, and we want them to remember us, remember them where we are, and I'm sure they will be seeing all of us in the future. Sometimes you can look at it thinking, well, oh, I can't leave anybody to the Lord. But it's not about that. It's about where they are on their life yes. of getting to the Lord. So it's just planting that little seed. We need to see the seed mm -hmm. plant out, ready for the next seed plant mm -hmm. and the next seed plant out. So don't think of it as if, oh, I can't do that. It's just planting those little seeds. And we've got Faye in the marketplace, and he prayed with Richard and about his wife. And he was really, he was, he was thrilled, wasn't he? He was really moved with that. So it's just great that we've got that time there. So thank you, Lord. This guy catches us up with his dog and gets talking to us and asks us, well, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Dudley, the black country. And uh, Johnny obviously said, I'm from Brazil. He said, well, what, what does a, a Dudley guy do with a Brazilian on the side of the <laughs> So I said, well, I said, it's, uh, it's a long story. I said, well, we met in church anyway. Long story short, guys. And we were about one and a half hours. This guy was walking with us, right? And we were able to he asked about church, he asked about how we became a Christian, I gave my testimony to him. We were able to give him the gospel. You know, that like, there's times when you're sowing and there's other times when the guys are just asking for the gospel. 
And uh, we, we gave him the loss. It turned out this guy had had leukemia and he almost died last year. But his niece, a girl called Amy, um, she, she's, a, she's a Methodist. She's a, a believer too. And I told him, I said, no doubt your niece was praying. And, uh, you know, we, we, just, we were so blessed. But I was thinking later, I thought, what were the chances? <laughs> of all the peaks in that area, you know, we chose that one. We chose a, a, a different route, so it would have been a bit easier if we'd gone the normal route. But we met at exactly the right time on the side of the mountain, you know, and this guy's heart was, was open. And you just think of all the other possibilities, and you see, it's a God moment. It's a God moment. Actually, the other thing is, Brian had printed out the business cards. I've never had a business card, but he gave me some like, business cards with my name and the church on it and everything. And I had some on me to give him. So, okay. So, well, praise God. The Lord knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Yeah. So, his name's Mark. You can pray for Mark. A lovely, lovely guy. So open, asking so many questions. You know, I said at one point, have you read the Bible? He says, no. He says, what? He says, I will get the Bible. He says, and I will. He says, I'm not just saying that. He says, I will read it. And so, uh, we, we were just encouraged by that. We were blessed. We were trying to share these things as well. He's asking them here and so on. Just praise God, praise God. Amen. It just meant the day. It meant the day. It was great time when it meant the day. Finish the day. Amen. Um, I'll tell you what, have we, have we got another song? Well, oh, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just see. I'll give you the notes and then we'll finish, we'll finish with the song, can't we? Yeah. And then you can have some coffee and tea. I know you're ready, right? Um, bless the Lord. So just let you know, folks, because you've been praying, Michel, our Frenchman, yes. he is back home now. Oh, yes. so, so he's recovering, praise God. <laughs> praise God. So keep praying for Michel and Lynette. Uh, just let you know as well, Christine, he's with us at the back there today. Yeah. Christine, we took her in the day for the surgical procedure to... to there's, there's a lump on her leg and she was concerned that it could have been cancerous. She's now had that diagnosis back and it's not. Yeah. And so, yeah. so you're going to have it removed soon, aren't you, Chris? Yeah, completely. Bless the Lord for that. That's good news. Uh, what else? Just to let you know, folks, that the encounter with God is round the corner. It's not too late to sign up, but we will need your money, all of it, in July, okay? I know, I know, but it's, it's literally, we've got to pay a month up front, uh, we have to pay everything off, so, yeah, this is coming. Bible study tonight, okay, it's 6.30, we continue with Matthew, okay, uh, what else? Tuesday morning, or not?
mission is to be a worshipping community at the heart of Kings Winford. Where every home is an expression of the kingdom. And every believer a disciple of the King. Our mission is to be obedient to the Great Commission. Through the faithful proclamation of the Gospel. And developing, equipping and sending of disciples. Welcome to King's Winford Christian Centre. 